So something which is very close to my heart, no pun in that intended here, neurocardiogenic syndrome. Um, so what is neurocardiogenic syndrome? It is the heart-brain cross-drug. So a healthy human body has a strong heart and a strong brain, um, and they live in synergy. So what happens in a disease state? As med students, um, which I believe most of the crowd here is, uh, we all have seen patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage um, where they get Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. What is Takotsubo? It is the broken heart syndrome. So what happens is the heart muscles get stunned or kind of stressed and function less as a response to the hemorrhage in the brain. So the brain hemorrhage is talking to the heart and making it stressed. So again, a brain-heart crosstalk. On the other side, um, are the patients with cardiac arrest. Uh, you all know that when there's a cardiac arrest, it's in the hospital or in the field, a CPR is done, then there's return of spontaneous circulation, then we cool the patients. And what do we do next? We call a neurologist. We ask the neurologist to comment or prognosticate on the extent of brain injury because the brain suffered the injuries which were caused when the heart stopped. Again, an example of a heart-brain crosstalk. So these are just examples and not the only disease conditions where the heart talks with the brain and this crosstalk occurs. So let us look at how does a sick heart affect the brain? So my research really focuses on atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation and cardiomolic strokes. So what is atrial fibrillation? Most, most of you guys know, but just a recap. This is a normal heartbeat, a normal ECG. In atrial fibrillation, the atrium of the heart, which is here, fibrillates, which means vibrates instead of contracting. So instead of um, pumping blood down to the ventricles, there is vibration in the atria, and that atria then accumulates blood and forms clots which go everywhere and um, the most serious complication of atrial fibrillation is thromboembolism thrombo means formation of clots embolism that they move around embolic risk to the brain which is called cardioembolism is actually eight times higher than these clots going to the periphery going to the foot uh, interestingly, AFib also increases the risk of dementia to by 30%, independent of the risk of stroke. So this is interesting to me because this is, again, a heart-brain crosstalk, uh, how a sick heart with atrial fibrillation is causing strokes. So the goal of my lab is to prevent cardiomolic strokes. And how can we prevent cardiomolic strokes? So let's take a tour of the lab, full disclosure, studies on AFib are very difficult, very cumbersome. Uh, a mouse heart beats 400 to 600 times per minute. So um, this is way more than a human. So EKG reviews and ECG reviews here and a day of telemonitoring takes several days of analysis. Okay, so what we, did we do? We take aged mice. These are males and females. We study both. We do not exclude females in our lab, um, which uh, most researchers do because um, one, it added, adds mice. Second, there are problems with cycling, but we study unanimously. These are aged mice, so these are not cycling. We induce AFib with drug or pacing, and you see here, this is the point, the heart was beating normally, we injected the drug, and now it is irregularly irregular. So there is atrial fibrillation. We implant monitors on these mice. We do telemonitoring, which means we monitor how much AFib burden is there. We do flow cytometry, where we study the immune cells. And then we sacrifice these mice and do histology, which is take sections and study different molecules, uh, more kind of uh, immunohistochemistry staining. So this is one of the data points we collected when we recorded males and females after that uh, injection. On the y-axis are the total number of AFib events. And as you can see, females had 
way more remains than males after a similar induction. And these are aged non-cycling females, which resembles a postmenopausal above 70 year woman. So um, what we found is was not known, but what we knew actually that sex differences do exist in AFib and this is known, it is being studied. This was a paper in 2005, which shows like when you compare the cause of stroke in women versus men, I don't know if you guys can see the black bar here. It's way high above here uh, in women as compared to men. And these are the strokes caused by from the heart in women. Um, you guys probably know the CHADS2 VAS score, which is used to stratify if a patients with high intermediate and low risk of cardioembolism or risk of stroke, just being a woman or a female is an automatic point in that score. Um, so if you are above a certain age and you are a female, you automatically qualify in the high risk category. So uh, we found something in the last slide along these lines that the women had, the females had more AFib burden. So ongoing studies in our lab are deciphering the underlying mechanisms more so uh, is there more inflammation which induces more AFib. So this is, was a little snapshot of the lab on uh, one project which we do, which is very uh, interesting to me um, and gives you an idea of what a lab looks like and what do we do in the lab, right? Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.